Welcome to another edition of the Ghana Web Road Safety Campaign here on Ghana Web TV. We are covering this extensively and that means we are looking at all angles of the subject of road safety. And so today we spend some time at the Top Tech Driving Institute where we'll have a feel of a typical class and then interact with some instructors to find out what goes into training and how important it is. We'll start with Jacob who is an instructor here at the Institute. Good morning and how are you? Good morning, I'm good. Okay. And you? I'm very well. How long have you been here? I've been working with Top Tech for seven years now. Okay. Great. And how has that been? Training different people, seeing new faces all the time? Yes, training different people and seeing new faces. You know, we are all from different backgrounds. Yeah. Sometimes you would have people come in and because they feel driving is for illiterates. Mm. That's how some people feel, driving is for illiterates. They uh -huh. come in here mm -hmm. because they, are, they have their doctorate degrees and all those stuff. When you come and you are telling them what they are supposed to learn when driving, they seem not to take it. But as time goes on, when you start the lectures and it sinks down to them, they comply. Mm. They now get into terms that driving is not just moving the car, it entails a lot. Okay. Driving entails a lot. Okay. And so what are some of the things or ideas people come here with, aside thinking that driving is for any trains, which I haven't heard about, by the way? Okay. Um, some ideas they also have is about the difference between manual and automatic. Mm. Most people come and they, after the inquiries, they get into the class and I start lecturing on manual. Then they keep asking, sir, uh, why are we only doing manual here? And I said, yes. If you do manual, it makes you a driver. Automatic doesn't make you a driver. How? If I, for instance, we are in the same house. Mm -hmm. There is an emergency. You say you're a driver, you have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. There is an emergency. The only car we have available is manual. You can't move a manual car. Mm -hmm. Are you a driver? Okay. A driver should be able to move every Both. car. Okay. And, and starting with a manual car is going to enable you to move yes. both? Yes. Starting with a manual, learning with manual car automatically moves you onto the automatic car. When you learn how to use manual, there is no need someone teaching you, do this with automatic car, do that, do this. It comes in naturally okay. when you use manual okay. to learn how to drive. That and is why in... Mm. Top tech transport and logistics. We don't do automatic. We only do manual. Okay. Usually you have a class full of students who are mixed, some literate, some illiterate. Yes. How do you manage to train these people so that no one feels left out? Okay. In top tech, our class is very, very interactive. The instructor doesn't come, say what he has to say, then he leaves. No. We make the class interactive. So I make sure within some few minutes, I know all my students, mm. what they, how they are, how they can speak, the language they can speak better. The only language, we've had French students here who do not even understand the English language very well. But we, we are able to inculcate some people who can explain the English language into French. So after the session, we sit down with the students, then we start all over again. Then the Frenchman will be explaining whatever he or she is learning to him. It comes to our local language. Some people come and all they can hear is, all they can speak is Ga. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can speak Ga, I speak English, I speak Tree, I speak Fanti. So I ask, where can you express yourself well? Mm -hmm. He says, oh, say Ga. Then I said, speak. When you finish, I'll explain to everybody so we understand. So we don't tell people you are an illiterate, so don't come to our school or anything. Anybody can learn how to drive. Anybody can learn how to drive. Okay, does this training translate to the mock exams you do here? Because yes, it translates to the mock exams. Mm. Some people do not understand the English language, but as time goes on, when we do it, gradually, they come to understand it. Even in the mock, sometimes those who are intellectuals, those who feel they are intellectuals, those who know book, it comes to the mock and you see them failing more than mm. those who come down to their level, pick up gradually. They rather pass more than 
those who feel I know book, I've gone to school up to this level. Okay. So you've been driving with people for long. Yes. What are some of the minor mistakes or even major mistakes you've noticed new learners or new drivers make when driving? Okay, because they are they are new on the road. One, they panic. When they see the cars moving like that, they mm. panic. So what they do is, they rather drive slowly. And in driving, to be a defensive driver, when you drive slowly, mm. you cause problem. When you drive recklessly, that is fast, you also cause problem. Mm -hmm. So it's in between, you shouldn't drive so slow, you shouldn't drive so fast. That is why the maximum speed of a learner is 50 kilometers per hour. Okay. That's the maximum for a learner. So the mistakes they do is, because of fear, they start to panic and they slow down on the road, mm -hmm. which is going to make other drivers bully them. So I'm always, I always urge, whatever you learned in the driving school, push it out there. The more you push it, the more you become perfect. There's nothing like I'm a pro in driver, driving. Every day we learn. Mm. Today, someone will make a mistake. You do something and you say, ah, what did I do? You start asking yourself questions. What did I do? Did I do this? What happened and I did this? We are all learning. We always learn every day. Must a learner be perfect before he gets onto the road after the driving school? No, a learner can't be perfect before he gets onto the road. Since driving is a learning process, mm. I've driven for years, I'm still learning. Do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Yes. So a learner should not be so perfect before he gets onto the road. But there are some basic things a learner should know okay. how to use the pedals how to change gears reflexes all those things a learner should know before he or she sets on the road okay if i sit in my car and i'm this is to educate people as well so if i if i sit in my car i'm a learner what are the first things i should look out for in my car okay before you move your car before you move, even before you start your car, there is what we call the daily pre-start checks, the routine checks you have to do. Mm -hmm. Things like checking if there is enough oil, checking if there is coolant. What we know, most of us know here is we put water into cars. No, we don't do that. When you put water into your car, you are going to rust the engine. Okay. You rust it. Because of oxygen in water, when it gets into contact with metal, it will rust. So not even if there's no coolant inside? No. Okay. You can't use water as a substitute. That's what we grew up to know. Mm. We see our parents putting water in there. We couldn't ask anything. We couldn't ask. We didn't know what was happening. But as time goes on, since education came in, we've learned so many things. Water is not perfect for our engine. Mm. Secondly, water evaporates. So you see those who put water, every morning you see them topping up. Mm. But with coolant, it doesn't ev evaporate. What it does is, it condenses, then it mixes up again. Okay. So all the time, coolant is in there. The only time your coolant will go down is when there are leakages on the pipes. That's when your coolant will go down. Okay. So we shouldn't be using water in our car. We should also check our brake fluids mm. if there are leakages. When you put brake fluid, it has a maximum level. Always it should be on the maximum level. Today you check, it was on the maximum level. Mm -hmm. The next morning you check, it's gone down. Why is my brake fluid going down? There could be an internal leakage, there could be an external leakage. If it's internal, it's dangerous. If it's external, because you are going to see it, it's okay. okay. So when it happens like that, you need to let the mechanic know and check why the brake fluid is leaking. That's for outside the car, but how That's about for outside if I sit the car. When we sit car. inside our car too, even with the mere starting of the car, there is a process. We don't sit in the car and just turn the key. The key goes through a process. Mm. We have, when you look at the ignition, there is lock, there is ACC, which is accessories, there is on and there is start. The key needs to go through that process. But sometimes when we sit in the car, the only thing we do is turn the key to start. Gradually, you are spoiling your ignition. Mm. Gradually, when you keep turning the key once and starting, you are spoiling your ignition. That's how come we see much uh, uh, public transport like Trotro, what we call Trotro. Mm -hmm. They can start the car, take off the key and put it in their pocket with no key, mm -hmm. which is wrong. When it happens like that, anything can start your car. When I pick a screwdriver, I fix it in the ignition, I turn, it starts. Okay. 
So security wise, it's not good. It's not advisable. Yes. Okay. Security wise, it's not good. Also, we have the instrumentation panel. We have the instrumentation panel, which really communicates with us. There is one which is called speedometer. We have the tachometer. We have the fuel gauge. We also have the temperature gauge. Sometimes people see overheating. Mm -hmm. When they notice there is overheating, it's when they see vapor coming out of a bonnet. By then, the temperature gauge in the instrumentation panel has given you proud notice mm -hmm. that your car is overheating. When you leave it and vapor starts coming, that is where your head gasket, so many things will get spoiled in your engine and it will cost you more. Okay. So all these things, when we, we have to be looking at them every time we sit in our car and we want to move. Okay. Now, as a driver, there are some things that are unavoidable, like brake failures. And if you, you happen to have that as a driver, what is the first thing, uh, first or immediate thing you should do to salvage the situation? All right. So I'll pick it from the aspect of manual and automatic. With manual cars, when you have brake failure, there is a second brake for you. Okay. which is your gears. The moment you have a brake failure, you start lowering your gears. You shouldn't panic. The moment you panic, you make a lot of mistakes. Mm. So with manual, the moment you lose your brakes, you see that your brakes are not working. Quickly use your gears, lower the gears. From five, you may come to four, three, two, then one. The car slows down. When the car slows down, now you can gain full control over your car. Now with automatic, when your brake fails, there is what we call the tiptronic. When you look at the automatic system, you have um, P, which is park, reverse, neutral, drive. Mm -hmm. the, with the drive, the D, you see plus and minus. Plus and minus. Quickly shift your gear lever to that section of the plus and minus and start shifting the gear lever to minus which is reducing the pace of your car. Mm. But it takes time before it happens. It takes time before that response. So what you can do perfectly is you look for places where there are not people, people are not around. Then quickly move your car towards that section. Where there will be less damage. Yes. Now Jacob, just before we end your session, give me three top tips you think that a learner or a new driver should know? One, the most important part is the brakes. When your windscreen is bought, is broken, you will not die. But when you lose your brakes, there is an issue. Yeah. So the important part is our brakes. We should make sure that our brake fluid is not leaking. How do we check it? We go through all the four tires. You pass your hand through the rims every morning to check if it's wet. If it's wet, you need to smell it. The brake fluid has a smell, a sharp smell, like uh, this tapping time. Yeah. Yes, it has a sharp smell. The moment you hear it's colorless, you touch and there is a smell, you should know that it is your brake fluid. Okay. When it's leaking, you shouldn't move. Don't let anybody deceive you. Yen yen kakran kakran fanko. No. Two, your tires. We feel the tire is just a rubber. We feel the tire is just a rubber which, is, which helps us to move the car. No, the tires comes with so many things. Tires comes with manufacturing dates. People do not know. There are tires we are supposed to use in our country, which is uh, the, uh, when we talk about weather condition, mm -hmm. the temperature. Temperature A, temperature B, we can use it in our hot terrain and uh, our hot weather and rough terrains. We also have the M plus S, which is mud and snow. We can also use here. But the temperature C is not for us. It's for the Western world. It can't stand heat. Okay. So sometimes, some years back, when I was growing up, I had every time this car has blown its tire. This tire, car has blown its tire. It was because of that. Secondly, the same tires. Mm -hmm. For organizers, they do not know the calibrations. The machines they use, they do not know the calibrations because every tire has the air pressure that needs to go in there. And air pressure in tires are measured in PSI, which is pounds per square inch, and kilopascal, KPA. Mm. The machine they use has those numbers. If the organizer does, doesn't know, all he needs to do is to put in air and feel, see that the tire is off 
the road. Then he knows that, oh, the tire has been inflated well. Or they hit it or kick it to see if it's very hard. No, every tire has the maximum pressure it can handle. Some say it's 51 PSI, some 50 PSI, some 45, some even 35. Mm. So if your tire says 35 and the organizer doesn't know, he puts in 40. He's putting pressure on the tire. So it's likely to blow out. And then the third, then the third one, it's about the cooling system of the car. When there is overheating, your car can burn. Your car can burn. Mm. So we should be very, very vigilant with the temperature gauge. When it's rising up into the red zone, quickly we have to pack and check. When there is overheating, what people we see people do, they open the bonnet. When they open the bonnet, then they'll start opening the radiator. Because they know it's dangerous, this is what they do. They'll be doing this. Then after they open it, you see them running away. We don't do that. We don't have to open it. You open the bonnet, allow the car to cool down totally. Before you open the before you open the radiator. Okay. Because the pressure that comes out of the radiator when pours on your body will peel off. So we should be these are three things we should every check. Should. Every driver should check when he or she wants to move or moves the car. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob, for sharing some tips and your experience with us. You're welcome. And so at this point, we'll just take a quick break and speak to Mr. Cecil Gabra, who is the owner of this institution. He's going to tell us the importance of training and what went into the establishment of this institution. My name is Nanama McBrown. I'm proud to be part of Ghana Web Road Safety Campaign. Please do the right thing. Save a life. Brim. So we are still on the conversation and aside speaking to the people who are on the ground and teaching uh, learners, we also need to get some insight from the owner of this establishment. I'm speaking to Mr. Cecil Ibo Gabra. He's the executive director of Top Tech Ghana, um, which also has a driving school. Many thanks for speaking to us, Mr. Gabra. You're very much welcome. Okay, so let's just get to it. How do you get? How did you get your training school established and registered with the DVLA? That's a very good and long question, right? Um, but Top Tech was established in 1996. This year we are celebrating our 25th year. And it all started by the man uh, seated here who has been the founder. And um, I'm reporting myself now that I started <laughs> driving at the age of 13 years. Okay. And then to those times there were no policemen to worry us, okay? Stealing daddy's car. Mm -hmm. and so on, driving around. I, I remember very well that my dad took me out and then um, I was waiting for him in the car. Nine o'clock, he wasn't coming. Ten o'clock when he came, he was um, a little bit intoxicated with al alcohol and he asked me, can you drive, Papa? And I said, yes, <laughs> I can. So I drove, brought him to this premises and the following morning, I took the advantage to move the car. Now. He stood up and said, who taught you how to drive? <laughs> <laughs> well, for those times, we were looking at um, the legs and the movement mm -hmm. of his hands and so on. And I said, yes. But I was all wrong at the age of 13 yeah. years. So in 1996, that was when it was established. Precisely. But how did you, what process did you have to go through to get it registered under the DVLA? Because that's an important aspect of getting your training school established? Yes, at that um, moment, I remember there were no uh, serious regulations to set up a driving school. So you register with the Registrar General, you have a company and then you start. But then within some few years um, after that, right, it was regularized, which means that you need to have this and that. And then um, being the past president of the Association of Driving Schools, mm -hmm. I took that advantage and then we set up a criteria with DVLA involved mm -hmm. saying that, look, um, those who were 
having driving schools, operating a comp center and internet cafes and so on, wouldn't be given any license and that the instructors, at least two of your instructors, must be trained by DVLA through NVTI. And then you should have um, at least a class that can take not less than 20 people. You should have a dual pedal uh, vehicle, mm. at least two vehicles that must have uh, the clutch, brake and accelerator system. Those days we were uh, much particular um, with learning by the manual. Um, we were in collaboration with DVLA to set up the rules and I'm happy to say that it stands as a test now that um, it shouldn't be a case that anybody stands up and say, come on, I'm setting up a driving school. There should be proper criteria where people must follow and abide by the rules and regulations and um, the acts of DVLA to establish driving schools and to control them. So I'll say in collaboration with uh, the Association of Driving Schools and then the DVLA, we are in place doing the right thing to teach people how to drive. And by doing the right thing, you mean all your trainers um, are students or products of the DVLA? Yes, that is how it's supposed to be. But unfortunately, not all of them um, have been through the, the process as I'm talking to you because here you are, you you um, sponsor the instructor and then tomorrow he's gone to another driving school. But then uh, for, for us here, what I want to say, which um, maybe DVLA will be so happy about is that we have got the ISO, which is International Standardization Organization certificate to even train driving instructors so i believe that very soon we'll be collaborating with dvla to give them proper training so those here yeah, those working with us here yeah, have at least um we have two of them with who have been certified by dvla and then the rest of them are going through um the process to be certified by dvla okay at the, at the very moment because we have not started but they are also receiving internal training from us and from the instructors who are already qualified. Okay, so just briefly tell me how you train people here. I believe in quality training, okay. Uh, first of all, if you call or you come here to um, make all the enquiries, we'll also interview you and make sure that your senses are really working. I mean, you have <laughs> excuse me, people who uh, have had problems with their brains and so on. The law says that mm. if you, you have any mental issues, don't try to, to drive. So after you've been through, you would we'll then put you in the lecture hall, okay? And this is compulsory. We have our register to make sure that you do between 18 to 20 uh, theory lessons in, uh, in driving. When you are through with this, then we'll take you to DVLA. That's if we're happy with you, we'll take you to DVLA um, and let you go through the issuance of learner's license. Mm. Now, as soon as you get your learner's license, then we would put you to start what we term as in traffic. As you mentioned the learner's license, and that's a very important thing for me because not so many training schools have students getting the learner's license before driving. Why are you so keen on getting that? And how important is it? The law states categorically that before you go on, your, on the road to learn as a beginner, you need to acquire a learner's license. And the law says that you must be physically fit. That is, uh, you should have all your limbs, all the, um, your body parts in touch okay before dvla issues you with a learner's license we do not want to have any issue with the ghana police to say you are teaching somebody illegally so we'll let you go through all those um, 18 hours before we take you to dvla without the the learner's license we are not going to teach you how to um, to drive you need to get a learner's license by law that says the law. If you look at the LI-2180, it is stated categorically that before you know how to drive, you should attain what we call the Linus license. And that 
if you have learner's license, you need a qualified instructor to teach you. Even if you go home and then you feel you can drive on your own, sorry, that's also, you know, against the regulations. Mm. We teach you all those things that you need somebody who is much more experienced with a license C and above, with at least four or five years experience um, in driving before you can move your vehicle. That's some extensive work you do here and we are grateful you could share a bit of that with us. That's uh, the executive director of Top Tech Ghana, Cecil Gabra, telling us um, what they do here and how intensive the work they do here is. Let's just go back to the classroom and get more insight from the instructors over there. So we are getting to the end of our conversation and we have a second instructor who is going to give us some different perspectives to training at a driving school and why you need to get enrolled in one to be a good driver and save other lives on the road. His name is Desmond Ouzu. Let me just start with this question. You know, there are physically challenged people who sometimes want to drive, some actually drive around. Have you had such students here? Thank you once again. Yes, we have in our institution. We have. Yes. Okay. And so how did you handle such situations? Okay. First and foremost, we don't discriminate here in top tech. Yes. When you come and you have challenges, let's say physically, or let's say, if I may say mentally, mm -hmm. we see the level of your disab uh, mm -hmm. disability and then we handle it accordingly. We've had people having this sickle cell problems mm -hmm. and some having issues with their legs and then their hands. As I said earlier on, we will see to it if your reaction towards problems is adequate, we can go ahead. But if it's not, we would have to tell you. Can you just tell us why road, road signs are important? Well, I learned my driving on my own with no, no help. So I wasn't familiar with road signs. But when I rode myself here at Top Tech, I was enlightened about them, which when you violate some of them, you'll be severely punished. Okay. You understand? So, road signs deals and plays major role in driving. Let's assume there's a, on this highway, there's a zebra crossing, mm -hmm. which is fading, or pedestrian crossway, which is fading. Every zebra crossing has a signpost there. Yeah. You understand? If I was taught on a, a, a field, like, not with an institution training, but someone taught me, a taxi driver or a commercial truck driver mm -hmm. taught me how to drive. I might see the sign, but how would you know? You understand? Yeah. We have road signs and then we have hand signs. A driver might be in the inner lane, stopping for someone to cross. I'm coming with top speed behind him. He pulls out his hand and does this. Me yeah. I should slow down. Yeah. But since I have no idea of it, what do I do? I still go down to the metal. I step on my pedal and then something happens. When you hit someone, there's a penalty mm -hmm. for you to bear. Yeah. And then you see in front of hospitals, let's say the Ministry of Defense, in front of them, when you get there, you can see there are some yellow markings over there. Mm -hmm. Those ones, we call them priority road. You and I. Before this in interview, you wouldn't know what yeah. it means. Yeah. But when we say a priority road, meaning when there's a traffic or even that section of the marking, you need mm -hmm. not to park on it. Okay. Priority means something great, right? Yeah. Yes. To the hospital. When you see that thing there, any ambulance can walk in and walk out. So if there's a traffic mm -hmm. and you are next to it, you don't have to park on it. Okay. Do you know we don't even park on it? When we are in traffic and then there's a zebra crossing, we don't even park there. You don't have to park on the zebra crossing. Okay. You understand? So, road signs, as we see them on the road, trust me, play major role in driving. 
Mm. Can you just give us like maybe three or four that are the commonest that everybody should know driving? Okay. I'll say the zebra crossing, speed limits, and then curves up ahead. Or let's say cattle crossing and those kind of stuff. Mm. At times you see cattle crossing sign, but we think, oh, there's no cattle crossing at that moment. They do cross. We always have to be vigilant on the road. To end it all, this is just something I want you to practicalize because I see half a tie here. How do you change your tie as a driver? Okay. On the highway, when you have a flat tie or a puncture to your tie, yeah. you would always need your triangles. You understand? On the major way, just like this one, you have to come off the road. Even as you are off the road, mm -hmm. you need to place your triangle. This thing here is called a triangle. You need to have more than two, let's say four in your car. You place it 10, 30 meters ahead of the car and then behind, mm. but not in line with where the car ends. You come off a little so that wherever the tire, the blown out tire is, you have stays there. So whoever is coming ahead or behind you would signal this before getting to you. Okay. You understand? Now, to change the tie, mm -hmm. we have so many things. We have the jack, we have the hose spanner, mm -hmm. and then a couple of stuffs that we use. Before you even jack your car, you need to strike the wheel nuts. They are nuts that are holding the rim onto the car. You need to strike them loose before you jack, you jack the car. When you jack it, you can use your hand or still the first panel to loosen it more so that you can take out the tie. Mm. When you take it out, the whole nut that you struck off the, the rims, you don't put it on the bare floor. When sun gets into it, when you are fixing it back, it's going to cause problem. So you either place it on top of the car or you open the back seat, you place it on the seat or where the, uh, the foot rest, the space mm -hmm. down there is, mm -hmm. you place them there. And then the blown out tie or the flat tie, you put it under the car. Okay. If you don't have a spare tie in your car, you have to put the flat one under the car because cars are passing and then someone can lean on the car, which will bring the car down. When okay. it comes down, you have a problem to yeah. handle. So you place the blown out tie under the car, get your spare tie. Mm. Now, we call it spare tie, but the right word is take home tie. Okay. Yes. It's for some few time. You, you, you actually have to fix it to get yourself out of that position okay. and then get to a organizer and get your tie fixed. You oh, so you're not supposed to use a spare tie for so long? No. You see yeah. these Uber guys using them, which mm. is very, very bad. Those small, small ties we see are yeah. called take home ties. You understand? Okay. Take home doesn't mean just place it and take your car home. You can take it, like fix it, and then go to your organizer, get your blown out eye, fix it. But if you see others use it for days, yeah. months, and then they, they, they begin to feel comfortable with, with mm. it, which is not right. And there are a lot of things that you've mentioned that people wouldn't know if they are not training or they are not enrolled in a training institution. So just to wrap up, can you tell us why anyone should get trained to drive? Okay. They say driving is for the brave, which at times I disagree. Anyone mm. can drive. Driving is fun. Mm. Come and get yourself on the road and start driving. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for talking to us and educating us about some of the things we do. We may not have known prior to this. We are grateful for your time. You're most welcome. That was Desmond Ousu, also known as Kobe by his students, sharing some advice and some educative tips for you and I. And you know from this that it's important to enroll in a training institution before you set out to drive. 
And that brings us to the end of this edition of Ghana Web Road Safety Campaign on Ghana Web TV. You can also join the conversation, send us videos of what's happening around you, absence of street lights, potholes on your roads, and so many other things, including accident scenes. Send it to us at the editor at Ghana Web email and on our social media platforms at the Ghana Web. You can also log on to our website, www.ghanaweb.com for more information. Until we meet next time, my name is Wanda Amihagan, and thank you for joining us.